I'm Alison and I'm a member of the oboe section in the BBC Symphony Orchestra. The oboes are part of the woodwind family which comprises of flutes, clarinets and bassoons but also a subsection called the double reeds which includes the bassoons and also bagpipes although they're not in a regular symphony orchestra. I'll go into more detail about the reed itself later but in short it's this thing at the top of the instrument and it's known as a double reed because it's got two pieces of cane vibrating against each other to create the sound. The oboes in an orchestra sit centrally behind the strings, next to the flutes and in front of the bassoons. The section generally has two oboes and one cormelet, but this is repertoire and period dependent. So I'll start by giving you an overview of the oboe before moving on to the core. Oboes are generally made out of guinadilla, also known as African blackwood. It's a dense, hard wood that enables the sound to project across the orchestra. Although you can get oboes made out of cocobola or resin. You can see when I turn it around that the oboe is conical in shape, unlike the flute and clarinet, which are cylindrical. From the front, the amount of metalwork can look rather intimidating and complex. However, if you imagine the oboe as a type of recorder, in essence a tube with no keys and just holes or tone holes where you put your fingers, the oboe is a souped up version and actually quite logical in its fingering system. Each of these thicker circular shaped keys represent the main tone holes. In a simplistic way, one finger is B, A, G, F sharp, E and D. The rest of the keys aid with helping play trills and sharps and flats. I also have three octave keys. There are two on the back and one on the side. And the octave keys allow you to jump octaves easily. This key on the back here is unique to oboists in the UK as we play on a slightly different fingering system to the rest of the world and it's called a thumb plate. I guess because you put your thumb on it and it looks like a plate. One of the earlier ancestors of the oboe was called a shawm, used in the Renaissance period roughly 13 to 1600 and it had no keys and was made out of one piece of wood. Over time, Sean developed into the Baroque oboe, so this was around 1600 to 1740. The Baroque oboe had a few keys and was manufactured into three pieces, enabling it to have greater accuracy of tuning. But because there were only a few keys, not all the notes could be easily played. By the end of the 18th century, an instrument was developed that allowed oboists to play semitones with greater ease and consistency. However, as technology advanced in the late 19th century, a new mechanism was developed and we had the birth of the modern oboe. The range of the oboe is small compared to most instruments being around three octaves. The lowest note is B flat, which is just below middle C. And for composers, I'd say A flat or G sharp, just below that three octave span is comfortable. The oboe can go a little bit higher, but it's extreme oboe playing. And though, although achievable, the result isn't always desirable. Because the reed on an oboe has a small aperture, the amount of air required to produce a sound would be less than, say, a flute. So you can play long phrases of music without taking a breath. And composers sometimes utilise this characteristic when writing melodies for the oboe family. To make a sound, the reed is placed on your lips. I form my embouchure, which is the posh word for mouth muscles, by rolling my lips over my teeth to create a cushion for the reed and use the side muscles to support. And it's about the pressure in these muscles and airspeed that create the correct environment to allow the reed to vibrate and produce a sound. Too little or too much strength here or in the airflow 
will mean the reed won't work. So what does it sound like? If you go to an orchestral concert, the first instrument you're likely to hear is the A played on an oboe. This A is given for the rest of the orchestra to tune to. Perhaps the nicest place to start would be with this little excerpt. synonymous with the oboe as it's the duck extract from Peter and the Wolf by Prokofiev. What I like about this solo is how Prokofiev utilises the lower register to create a dark and rich sound. Sibelius also uses this quality in his writing a lot but check out the second or fifth symphony to hear this. The oboe is frequently used to create a reflective mood in music perhaps because the quality of sound is haunting. That was the solo from the stereophonics version of Handbags and Blood Rags. Now, some composers like Stravinsky, Ravel and Debussy utilise the top range of the oboe as it's quite ethereal. Here's a brief extract from Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony. play smooth or legato, there's also tongued notes. How a composer writes really affects the end product. There's spiky tonguing, like in Duca's Sorcerer's Apprentice. Here, the tongue stops the note by quickly resting on the reed and stopping the air from going through it. Now, there's also softer tonguing, like Mendelssohn's Scottish Symphony. Control of the airflow is what stops the sound. The oboe has a diverse range of colours and characteristics, which is one of the reasons I love it so much. I have merely scratched the surface, but I hope it gives you a little taster of what the oboe can do. <laughs> It's a beautiful tenor oboe, but has a confused identity because no one quite knows why it's called the cor anglais. It's not a horn and it wasn't developed in England. There's lots of theories about how the name came about. One is that as its predecessor, the oboe de catcher or hunting oboe, a Baroque tenor oboe, that it was shaped like a giant banana with a brass bell. And it's the curve or angle or anglais in French that was used to describe the cor anglais. The theory I rather like though is the image of angels in stained glass windows in Germany playing an instrument similar to the cor anglais but with the same type of fluted bell as on the oboe de caccia. And perhaps this gave rise to the name anglish horn or angelic horn. But you can hear how anglish and english sound very similar. Who knows what the real story is? It doesn't really matter. It's still a fabulous instrument. 
As you can see, the core is a bit bigger than the elbow. It's actually half as big again. And it has this funky shaped bell, which looks a bit like a pear. This gives the core like a different quality of sound to the oboe. I'd say plummier, rounder, and of course, because it's bigger, it's a deeper sound. You would learn to play the cor anglais once you grasped the art of the oboe. The other difference is this extra piece of metal here, which is known as the crook, and the reed is placed on top. Now, the reed of the cor is different to the oboe, but again, I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Other than that, it's very similar to the oboe. To make life easy for oboe players to transition to the cor anglais, the cor anglais is a transposing instrument. This means that the music I read when playing the cor allows me to use the same fingering as I would on the oboe, but the pitch that comes out is a fifth lower than what's written. The range is a little smaller than that of the oboe. Generally, the lowest note is a written B or sounding E for most instruments. <laughs> to go up to about a written top F sharp, so a sounding B. I'll compare pitch for pitch with a slow scale on the oboe and chord, so you can hear exactly the difference, the similarities between the two instruments and how they complement each other's ranges beautifully. seems to be the musical heartbreaker, death and doom bringer, and will often herald tragedy. The orchestral solos can be extensive and allow the player to have a freedom to fully express themselves, because frequently the orchestral accompaniment is minimal to bring the core sound to the fore. I don't have a favourite instrument between the oboe and core, because each has a different orchestral role. And as I said, the core is soloistic in nature, but the oboe is much more involved in the section and rapidly changes from musical goalkeeper to striker. On the core, there are many slinky sounding solos that use the silkiness of the instrument's tonal qualities. Here's a little extract from Mussorgsky's Kovanishka in the Persian dance. Even though the range of notes in this extract is limited, you can hear how alluring it is. is often used to represent characters. Now, in Defire's three-cornered hat, a movement titled The Miller's Dance, the Spanish composer uses the core to portray an angry wife who's shouting at her husband. He manages to give the flavour of Spain whilst using the lower register of the core and the more honky quality of sound, as you can imagine, the wife telling her husband to get out of the house. And of course, the most recognised coronary 
solo would be the Largo from Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. Here, as the Coronglo reaches to the high notes, you can hear the yearning in the sound. shared a little of my passion for these two beautiful instruments. However, I did promise a little bit more information about reeds, but we have to move to my kitchen to do that. So it's not that I cook reeds, it's just that when I moved house I noticed that this breakfast bar had an excellent table leg to tie reeds onto. A telltale sign that you're living in the home of an oberist are the bits of thread dangling from various pieces of furniture. You can buy reeds and they work really well, but many oberists make their own. Perhaps it's because it gives it a greater control over the end product, but reed making is a little bit like baking. You can have the same ingredients, but yet some cakes just turn out better than others. So I thought with the aid of technology and a little bit of Blue Peter, here's one I made earlier, I'd speed up the process and make a quick read for you. Now read making is a very personal thing. No two oberists will make the same read. And it's all to do with the dimensions. I won't really go into it, but there's lots of alterations along the way. Now I have a lot of tools to aid me and it's just another side of playing a double reeded instrument. Even though I've got lots of sharp equipment, I've never really hurt myself. It's, I'm more likely to get a sort of type of paper cut from the cane than I am from a knife. The tools themselves are named after the role they play in the process of reed making, but I'll explain as I go along. Firstly, you have a piece of cane, and this is known as tube cane because it's like a tube, and this is a dried form of a type of bamboo. And we rather satisfyingly split this into three with a cane splitter. Now, with this, you would soak the cane for a bit. I've done this earlier. And then you would cut it to size with a guillotine. Now, this piece of equipment has a dual purpose. So it's got a guillotine and the measurement between here and here is the exact distance I need to get the required length of cane. So here's the guillotine. I would normally spend it's a really skanky looking piece of cane actually, but I would normally take a bit more time doing this, cut the end off, <coughs> woo, and then measure to there to there. And again, <coughs> and that is the correct length of cane. So, I go to the pre-gouger. Now, again, I've started one. You can see that you have the bed, and this is where the cane goes, and there's um, a very complicated knife system here, and that 
means that the cane is sheared and it means that less work is taken for the gouger. So I have to put it on here because of the handle. Put another piece in here just to show you. So when you turn, you get this big thick stuff that you don't want and the desirable piece of cane that you do want. And you can see already how much thinner it is. So from there, we have the gouger that gouges. And I would normally do this so that the machine is facing me, but you're over there. And again, it goes into this bed like this and very fine shavings of cane come off, which is not far off already. You can see just a tiny amount has come off. Pre-gouge has done a very good job. And we do this until the correct distance thickness is created. So I have a little micrometer And here it says 60. And actually that's not too far off what I like. So I'd normally let this piece of cane rest for a couple of weeks before brutally attacking it again. So the next process is to shape the cane with a shaper. Now I have one which looks a little bit like this. There's lots of different shapes. And this mould here is the shape of the cane that I will eventually come out with. So pop the blades in here, piece of cane in here, put the weight over the top, press it down a bit. And the two blades here ease side to side and scrape off the cane to the desired shape. Voila. I fold it in half. And you can begin to see that the reed is going to take shape. Here's a piece of coronglay cane that's already shaped. And you can see that it's bigger, it's wider, and I don't know if you can see how much, but it's, it's a little bit thicker as well. So I need to attach this piece of cane to this staple. And an oboe staple is longer than a coronglé staple. And this coronglé staple looks like this. And you can see that an oboe staple has this piece of cork, and that's really just to create an airtight seal when it's put into the top of the oboe. Now, although the coronglé staple is shorter, I kind of see that the crook, which is that piece of metal at the top of the instrument on the core, is like an extension of the staple. You can see it kind of makes sense. And there's the cork. There we go. So before we carry on, I need to just take a little bit of this cane off here to make it easier to attach it to the staple. You can probably hear my cat trying to get in, my glamorous assistant. Anyway, but now we have to move so you can see me tying it on. So this is the tying on process and you need a nice sturdy position, nice firm leg or something like that to tie onto. I'm gonna use a nice orange jolly color. I like to have bright colors making reeds. There we go. Now here's the piece of cane, here's the staple. And the other thing we need is this tool, and this is called a mandrel. And all that does is put that into the staple like this. It just makes it easier to tie onto, really. And I have my reed loosely positioned onto the staple. And I have a set of calipers at the correct distance. 
and that shows me where the correct length of the reed is. Now, again, this is very personal to each oboist as to how long they want their reeds to be, and it's a little bit dependent on the type of shape they've chosen as well. So that goes like that, and here's the moment of truth. There we go. And then I just pop up to the top. And what I try to do is to get both sides to be closed on either side. And actually this side isn't closed yet. So there we go, one more. And I put that little pencil mark so that I don't go above the length of the staple. So I'm back at my station and we have our tied on reed. Now normally I would leave reeds in this state for another week or so just to settle. So Blue Peter style, I have another one. And this one's been soaking. And this is where the fun really begins because at this point it's impossible to play. There's no, there's no aperture, it's just a folded seam in the cane. So, what we have to do is to scrape it. Now, years ago, people, actually people still do it, so I don't see why years ago, people would use a knife like this and spend a long time taking the bark off until they had created the correct pattern on the reed that they wanted. Now, one of the beauties of being in the BBC Symphony Orchestra is the variety of music that we play. Now, because of that, I find that I need a variety of reeds, and so make quite a lot. And to ease this, I have a machine called a profiler. And what this does is that, let me have a look, here we go. You can see that this has this metal plate here, and this is like a pattern for the reed. Maybe closer up, you can see. And instead of me having to create this shape with a knife, the machine does it by this blade here rolling over the top of the metal plate and cutting into the cane. So to make it work properly I have to what's known as rough scrape so just take a little bit off and I'm getting rid of the bark of the cane to get into the flesh. again and then we have another guillotine and this is to take the tip off and we should then be able to see that the reed is beginning to look like something that you could actually use so pops in here and again there's measurements along here that enable me to work out roughly what the desired length will be it's quite brutal all of this now, we have an aperture and what I need to do is make the top of this reed a lot thinner because at the moment this would be almost impossible to play. So this is a little bit like a mandrel, pop that in, put it over the tongue, screw it in place, hold it in place. And off we go. I'll see you at the end. So this is the reed fresh off the profiler. 
And what I'd normally do now is give it a quick toot to see if it's something that I'm likely to want to use in the future. But even then, I would leave it a few days before finishing it off. And what that really means is that I'd use a knife just to go over the reed and make it exactly how I like it. If you were to go to rehearsals and look at professional oboists, you'll see that most of them have got pliers and knives and goodness knows what else by their feet. And it's because reeds are always changing. And so in rehearsals, you kind of finish them off. And even just before a concert, you're never quite sure. So you're just always adjusting the reed to fit the hall and the acoustic and the temperature of that particular period in the year. So it is an art in its own form, really. But it is an interesting aspect of playing the oboe in Coron Grey and bassoon. Bassoonists do this too. But um, anyway, for me, that's me over and out. And I really hope I've given you an insight into both the oboe and Coron Grey and unlocked some of the mystery of reed making.